a good investment for the state that would be a good use of taxpayer dollars. Um, you know, I always want to know how far they can stretch their dollars, what their what their overhead is, how much are they spending on administrative costs versus actually spending on the population they're designed to serve. And when you compare what your your nonprofits are doing versus what your government agencies are doing, they just do a much better job of stretching dollars and, and yielding results. Not all of them, and that's why I'm not willing to fund all of them, um, but your good ones just do a better job of stretching dollars and making uh, more effective use of those taxpayer dollars. So I suppose the question at that point would be then why do you, why, why wouldn't the government then simply look at the internal structure of these uh, nonprofits and these private institutions and simply implement those as solutions to its own infrastructure? I would love to see more of that. Um, you, you have, and I've, I experience this all the time, you just have a lot of pushback from your government departments anytime you suggest any sort of reforms. They, they just don't like to do it. And, and I could speculate on the reasons, we all could speculate on the reasons, but um, anytime you try and reform any sort of department, it, it, is, uh, it is quite the fight. And so far um, ha has been an unsuccessful fight, but that is something that I'm certainly very much open to. Um, and we haven't talked about this, but so one of the positions I hold in the House, I'm, I'm chair of a committee called the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules, which doesn't sound very sexy at all, but it's a committee that's composed about both senators and House members, and we have a lot of oversight of the government agencies and the, the regulations that they're pushing down. So I've been trying to do some things um, kind of behind the scenes in my role as chair of that committee to, to force the issue on some of those internal reforms. Um, but unfortunately, the problem, one of the big problems, and, and this opens up another can of worms, but when you have, when you have short term limits like we do in Missouri, the problem is it usually takes a while to get any sort of bill, any sort of change across the finish line. And what you see with the departments is uh, if you have a particular representative or senator who's really excited about, you know, reforming a system, they usually have mechanisms to, to stall and block things for a while and can usually sort of uh, block things long enough for that person to turn out and be gone. So I think we, there's a lot of structural problems that make it hard to do that, but the, the short answer is I'm 100% on board with you. I would love to do that. We have a really good question from Jessica Rink in a 10 a.m. class. She said, if the minimum wage in Missouri stays at 11 15 an hour, but continues to rise in other states, how do you intend to keep the cost of living at an affordable level for those who are making minimum wage? She uh, asks, and I think argues in her question, is it reasonable to expect that they can still afford a life above the poverty line? So I think the minimum wage is going up more than that automatically based on something that got passed at the ballot box a few years ago. So I don't think it's stuck there. I think it's continuing to go up. Um, I've always been a little nervous about meddling in the minimum wage issue because I, I think what you see is when those minimum wages go up, all the businesses that are hiring those people have to raise their prices. So I, I don't know that ultimately you see much benefit with minimum wage increases because of those across the board price increases that come with them. And um, at the end of the day, I'm not sure that, that there's really much benefit. I think it's kind of a wash for everything. So I get, I get a little skeptical of um, that type of thing coming from, uh, from the government. I would like to open it back up, but before I do, one question real quick from Kenzie Taylor Kilpatrick, an online student. Uh, she asks what your opinion is on school security do you plan to do anything to improve it? So one of the things that we've been looking at over the past couple years um, and, and trying to work directly with our superintendents too because I, you know, I'm not going to say that I, I have a great deal of knowledge about school security and how all that works. So working with our local superintendents to find out what they need, what resources the state can provide. We've had a number of discussions about that. There are a number of groups working on it now to try and for the legislature and the school superintendents and school districts to work together to find out what we can do at the state level to help. So I'm, I'm certainly interested in seeing what they ask us for and then seeing what we can do to meet that ask. 
Ken would like to open the floor. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so this is going to be completely different than every other question you've had. Well, good. But um, you mentioned a little bit uh, about like your party and how you kind of agree with some of the things that the Democrats pass, uh, and I'm sure that the Democrats agree with some of the stuff that you pass. So do you think that the two-party system that is, you know, that, that runs this whole shindig is functional enough, or do you think it holds back legislation more often than not? You know, I think it is functional. I don't, I, I, I can't think of a better system, but in both, in both the Republican and the Democrat caucuses, it's it's really multiple factions within them. The, the the Democrats are certainly divided between three or four different factions. We are in the the Republican side too. So I think one of the interesting things you see in Missouri politics um, is very rarely do you have a bill pass that's that's a pure partisan split. That's just all the Republicans on one side, all the Democrats on one side. Probably eighty. 85% of the bills that are passed are bipartisan in some form or fashion. You have weird coalitions of Republicans with weird coalitions of Democrats all joining together to pass something. So the number of bills that are purely Republican versus Democrat that actually make it to the governor's desk are extremely, extremely low. So I, I think that probably indicates that our system works. There is some bipartisanship in there. It's, it's just a really messy, clunky system. <laughs> Okay. Which, I, which I think is probably good. You know, as an individual legislator, it's frustrating when every single bill I file doesn't become law. But when you take a step back and look at what's best for the state of Missouri, I think it would be a really terrible thing if all 160 bills that the House passes every year became law. There's a lot of junk that gets passed in there too. So I think having a slow, clunky system where you have every ideology at the table and have an opportunity to provide input is, is good and results in better public policy for the state. Speaking of legislation that you've supported, we have a question from Caitlin Neely uh, about Bill 576, it, which requires a state agency to repeal two existing rules before enacting a new one. She wanted to know why you chose to sponsor it. Uh, so that was a bill that I saw um, Ohio pass a couple years before I was in the legislature, and this goes to some of this theme that we've had today about some of my frustrations with the bureaucratic system and it not doing a very good job. Um, so one of the issues that we have in state government is we have something like 140,000 regulations on the books. That's not including federal regulations, not including county regulations, not including city, not including any of that. And. Um, and, and my role as a, as a lawyer, what's become increasingly frustrating to me is when you have people who come to you that just want to start a business, take care of their family, live the American dream, but they have no idea how to start because of all the complex regulatory code that's out there that they have to jump through all these hoops. So they feel like they have to come to someone like me, pay me money to do it just so they can take care of their family. So. One of the things that that bill is designed to do is to make sure that the, regu that the departments are policing themselves and making sure that if you have regulations that are currently on the books that maybe made sense 20, 100 years ago when they implemented them, but don't make sense anymore, that have become more burdensome than they provide any positive results, that they are being forced to go back and make sure that they are repealing those old, outdated, problematic things before they implement new ones. Another question about another bill that you sponsored, uh, HB 494. This question is from Yi Tong, a 9 a.m. student. This bill prohibits homeschool students from participating in any event or activity offered by the school district in which the student resides. She asks, what are your views on the bill? And do you think it's fair, she says, to keep homeschoolers out of public school programs? Uh, so I, I, I did not sponsor that, and I would never support that. Um, I'm a homeschool kid myself, and I, I have supported legislation that actually does this, just the opposite, that opens up more opportunities for homeschoolers to participate in those types of extracurricular activities. So my view is just the opposite. All right, thank you for correcting the record then. Um, Kaylee Marr, an online student, asks about um, statements you've made about the need to protect religious freedom. She says, I feel as if there is plenty of freedom to practice and preach as we please. Is this protecting businesses that want to refuse service to people and use their religion as a reason? 
And if so, is that worth protecting? So I haven't, I, so I have sponsored one religious freedom bill. And what that bill does is it prevents government from closing places of worship. So that was obviously as a result of some of the things that we saw during the COVID pandemic where you had government entities within the state, within the country, um, that were closing places of worship, saying you couldn't go to your church or your mosque or your temple or whatever, but it's okay to go to Walmart still or, or things like that. And that never made sense to me. You know, I, I again, it goes back to that personal freedom. If an individual chooses to take on whatever risk is out there and if they want to go gather with the other individuals to worship whatever God they believe in, then I don't think it's my job to say that they can't gather together to do that. So that's what that bill does. That's what I support. Um, and, and I've filed that in the past and we'll continue to work on that. Yeah. So it says that you are a, a longtime member of the NRA and that you were a co-sponsor of the Second Amendment Preservation Act. Um, I'm curious as to what you are doing to fight the government overreach um, regarding our rights of arms. So we passed a, uh, in my first year, something called the Second Amendment Preservation Act. And what that bill does is it uses a, a legal doctrine called anti-commandeering, which is the same doctrine that a lot of these states have used that have legalized marijuana, even though it's still illegal at the federal level. Um, but what it does is it says that the federal government cannot require the state to use state resources to enforce federal law. So that's how they've legalized marijuana in Colorado and Washington, things like that. Even though it's still illegal at the federal level, all it says is you can't use, you, federal government, you can't come in and say the, the state highway patrol has to enforce your law. If you're gonna come in and enforce your law, you have to do it with your own agents. So that's what that bill does, is say if you have some sort of bill that, some sort of law that comes down from the federal government that there's concern that it unfairly infringes on our folks' Second Amendment right to bear arms, that they can't say, you know, Green County Sheriff, you have to go take that guy's gun. Uh, the federal government has to come in and do it themselves. So that's what that is. Yeah. So one talking point that people who support Roe v. Wade have is that if states are willing to overturn Roe v. Wade, why aren't they more likely to support the foster care system and uh, kind of fund more money that way? Uh, so I was just curious, is there anybody in the House right now that is pushing to support the foster care system? Yeah, th there is. There's a lot of us, actually. So in my first year, we passed a number of bills on both foster care and adoption to, to provide more tax credit assistance for people who are trying to do that, because it is. It's just outrageously expensive. And I don't think that you can claim to be pro-life and, and, and to honestly be pro-life and for that to end at the point of birth. So um, if, if we're going to be in this, this climate where you're going, to be, you're going to have more kids being born and probably a lot into tough circumstances, we need to make sure that we are doing everything we can at the state level to have a good foster system, a good adoption system that's not going to be cost prohibitive for, for parents who are just trying to you know, take care of these kids. So I am very much in support of those types of things. We've got a lot of bills in the works that are are several things that we're working on right now with a number of groups within the House and Senate to work on that going forward. Because I think we all recognize that that's a big need in the state. Yeah. Um, what if you like a weird change?